There are precious few aircraft designers that started their careers by making biplanes and finished it making supersonic jets. But there are even fewer engineers that got their foot in the door by designing naval biplanes and made it to supersonic carrier-based fighter jets. Spoiler, there's only one such engineer and his name was Leroy Grumman. His contribution to the advancement of naval aviation is nothing short of tremendous. At some point, Grumman had such a hold on the Navy that the American Congress had to step in and force the Navy to employ less effective designs from other manufacturers just to break the monopoly. Otherwise, competitors didn't stand a chance against the undisputed king of carrier-based aircraft. Grumman's ascent was meteoric. As his company was initially dealing mainly in aluminum floats, no one considered it a major player in the market. But then, seemingly out of nowhere, it came up with a whole line of aircraft designs and eventually won the order for a new biplane fighter of the U.S. Navy, effectively beating Curtis and Boeing, two titans of the industry. The Grumman F-3F wasn't without flaws, but it was good enough to kickstart the career of Leroy Grumman as an esteemed aeronautical engineer. By the end of the 1930s, the Navy invested heavily into new designs, wanting to replace biplanes with monoplane aircraft. Grumman was in no rush to submit his designs, though. He let Brewster, with their Buffalo, take the lead. Why? Because Grumman knew that in aeronautical engineering, you don't necessarily have to be the first, you have to be the best. So while Navy pilots were busy learning to fly the first monoplanes, he took his time to finish the design that eventually became one of the greats, the F-4F Wildcat. This carrier-based fighter also had its flaws, but its list of strengths was so long that the aircraft stayed in production right till the very end of World War II. Even after the arrival of new designs with much better performance, the Wildcat was still in a class of its own due to its ability to take off from shorter flight decks and unprepared or semi-prepared airfields. Furthermore, Grumman quickly realized the limitations of single-engine aircraft, especially carrier-based ones. That's why, with the Wildcat still in development, he started working on the XF-5F, a twin-engined interceptor with an outstanding rate of climb. This vehicle, as well as its XP-50 variant, which was tested against other designs, was never accepted into full-scale production, but the experience of working on it really came in handy after the U.S. became engaged in the Second World War, as the Navy were in dire need of a new line of powerful single-engine carrier-based aircraft to replace its pre-war designs that were already obsolete. Grumman was ready. First, he gave the Navy the Avenger, a carrier-based torpedo bomber. And then, in 1942, he presented the mighty F-6F Hellcat. Originally, it was supposed to be just a heavily modernized Wildcat, but during development, the aircraft turned into an entirely new fighter which was quickly recognized and appreciated by pilots of the entire anti-Hitler coalition. It was the Hellcat that became the dominant single-engined, carrier-based fighter of the U.S. Navy in World War II. Its main rival, the Vought F-4U Corsair, was equally impressive, but didn't have quite the same numbers production-wise. While doing all that, Grumman kept working on his twin-engine fighter design, and for a good reason. The Navy were adamant that there was a need for this type of aircraft. It was 1943 when the new fighter finally took to the skies. It was the F-7F Tiger Cat, a glorious carrier-based heavy fighter with tricycle landing gear. Unfortunately, it was deemed combat ready only after the end of the war, and so it didn't see any action right then and there. The same fate was shared by the F-8F Bear Cat, which was designed to intercept Japanese kamikaze planes. The idea was pretty straightforward, to take the engine of the Hellcat and then build a small, lightweight aircraft with superior acceleration capabilities around it. The Bearcat didn't make it to the Pacific Theater of Operations, but it was used by the U.S. in the Korean War, and the French flew Bearcats in Algeria. Most notably, the Bearcat became insanely popular among air racers. 
It's still flown competitively to this day. After the advent of the jet engine, Grumman did just the same thing as before. He let one of his competitors take the lead with the F2H Banshee. Why be the first when you can be the best? The F9F Panther, developed by Grumman, overshadowed all of its competition and by the start of the Korean War became the main carrier-based jet fighter of the U.S. Navy. And when it became clear that straight-winged aircraft could no longer keep up with the times, he redesigned the Panther for the swept wing, creating the F-9 Cougar, which was soon accepted into production. At the same time, Grumman was well aware of the limitations of the swept wing, and as early as the first half of the 1950s, he started working on a design with a variable geometry wing. The experimental F-10F Jaguar, which was the result of this work, is not available in the game, but it was a very important aircraft at the time. It just came too early. The industry wasn't ready for this level of technological complexity yet. The supersonic F-11F Tiger, on the other hand, turned out so impressive that the Navy were ready to award Grumman the contract without any tendering. That's when the government, with their anti-monopoly regulations, had to step in. And so an aircraft by another company, the McDonnell F-3H Demon, which entered trials a bit earlier, was chosen as the new main carrier-based fighter. In the end, the Tiger became only the second most produced naval fighter of that generation, but it was still pretty clear who was really ruling the roost. By the way, it was the F-11F that was the Blue Angels flight team's aircraft of choice for around 30 long years. Systems and procedures that were set in place to prevent companies from forming monopolies did put an end to Grumman's reign. But engineers of the company were still the main experts in the field of designing carrier-based aircraft. They still had all their experience and talent. During the Vietnam War, when the spotlight was on the iconic Phantom, they bided their time, getting ready for a triumphant return. And the Navy? They were all for it. After all, they needed the best design they could possibly get if they were to have a fighting chance against Soviet MiGs. And so they turned to the experts. The maiden flight of the F-14 Tomcat, which became Grumman's swan song, took place in 1970, and this carrier-capable fighter instantly put the engineer back on his throne. Twelve years later, Grumman passed away at the venerable age of 87, with his position as the king of carrier-based aircraft still uncontested. And the Tomcat? It remained in service for more than 30 years, and was still as popular with the pilots on its last day of service as it was on its first. What are your favorite aircraft designed by Grumman? Tell us in the comments below.